we start off all these with the same question, which is, uh, what was your life like growing up, and what were you like growing up? Um, yeah, that, thank you. That's that's a, that's it's always a good question. Um, I'll I'll be be honest. My I had a great upbringing. Um, my uh, my mom and dad uh, grew up a couple houses away from each other and uh, moved up the street and got married. Uh, I, I was from a very tight knit uh, family, so you know Sunday dinners and uh, you know the cousins all around always um, in a really you know really community based neighborhood. I grew up in the in the Waterbury Prospect area, so not too far away from here. Uh, my mom and dad were both teachers, so there was obviously a, a, a big focus on education and. Um, you know, I think I was talking to you about this, you know, an interesting story. You know, my grandfather came over from Italy, from, you know, Ellis Island, and, uh, you know, came into New York, you know, and made his way into Waterbury, Connecticut. And he, um, he started a, a tailor business and a dry cleaning business. So there was entrepreneurial spirit, right, you know, right from the beginning, you know, as far as, uh, um, as, as we can go back. And my, uh, my dad was working for him, you know, all, you know, you know from all his uh, teenage years growing up. And he would always tell me this story uh, that they would uh, drop the dry cleaning off at um, a number of different businesses and at schools. And one of the schools was Taft. And he would say to my father, um, you know, I, I'm, I work hard and we work hard so that you and your sisters, uh, you know, will never have to have, um, you know, you can go to college and you're not going to have to have any anything to, to worry about after that. And then it's on you. You have to, you know, take care of that. And my gift to you is always going to be your education. And uh, someday I hope that you can continue to pass that on to your children. And, you know, you should have your, your kids go to good colleges and, and, and ideally even private schools and, and look at the school here. So he would take them to Taft all the time and would say, look, at this is not a college. This is a, this is a high school. This is amazing, and, and, and this is, you know, so for his, his vision of what he had seen from when he came over and what he was able to make for himself and the passing on to my dad, and my mom and dad both worked, you know, multiple jobs. Uh, they were both teachers, worked night school, and uh, so education was just constantly pounded, constantly pounded. And, and not only the education, but like, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up, and, and what do you want to do? And I was very into sports, um, and obviously very into music, and you'll hear some of that in the story. And but they always kind of try to help keep and keep and guide me onto the onto the big picture, right? You know, just you have to get a good education; it's the basis for everything. And uh, you have to go to you have to go to college. So that that was that was what my my upbringing was like. There's another interesting piece of this in that I, I was a, a musician, and I, I think you're always kind of a musician. If you're an artist, you're an artist. Although I don't, uh, you know, play out anymore. And uh, I, I made a living doing that all the way up until the point where I got into computer software. And um, <laughs> I, my first college didn't go so swell, didn't go, so, didn't, didn't go good, kind of had to leave there and, and, and do a kind of take two on that act. And uh, I told my parents, I, I want to jam. I just want to jam. You know, I want to be in the band. We got to keep the band together. We got to keep moving. And there's like, the band is going to be fine. But what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get a, a, a degree. And I said, well, I want to go to music school. And I said, all right, well, we'll let you go to Berkeley and Boston for a little while and get that out of your system. They told me. I said, all right. So I went there and I just absolutely fell in love. And, and that was the first time that I found work ethic. Um, you know, I caught the first tee, you know, it was like 445, 5 o'clock in the morning, caught it into Boston, hit the practice rooms and, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours a day came back, practiced all night, went to bed, did the same thing over and over again. And I remember I got the call from my parents and they said, uh, okay, you can't do this anymore. Like you can't, this is not a real degree. You have to go to college and you have to get a, you have to get a normal degree. And, uh, they put that on me. And so I, I loved snowboarding and I loved hiking, loved the outdoors. So I picked from UVM and I went up to UVM and, uh, but you know, I, I look back on it and I, and I understand now what they were trying to tell me at the time in that you, you're always going to be able to have this, but you know, we, we want you to go through the process of, you know, understanding, you know, your education and, and being more diverse across this. And it taught me the people skills that I have today. So that's kind of the, you know, vision of kind of what came from, you know, my background and my grandparents and to my parents and their work ethic. And then just even in a difficult phase where they knew I was passionate about something, seeing a little bit beyond, you know, where I, where my vision was, which is a little more short sighted in retrospect and uh, pushing me to, uh, you know, develop structure, which I have today. So you spent a long time actually out there gigging. Uh, okay. And what did you take away from that that served you as an entrepreneur? Um, you got to fight. 
Yeah, it's and, and literally fight for the money. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, leading these bands and, and just having to go in, into the back, you know, room and say, well, yeah, you got to pay us. And, uh, you know, everyone's standing outside like, are you, you go in. No, you, I'll, I'll go in. I'll go in. I'm going to go in. I'm going to go get it. And uh, just having to go in the background and just and you get into arguments with people over, you know, we just played a gig. We packed the house. You know, you got to pay us. Nah. I think you guys drank a lot of beer. Uh, I, I think it all evens itself out. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. And so just, it, it just, it's taught this kind of negotiation skills and these people skills, um, you know, that you just, you got to stay calm, right? you got to stay even, cool, collected, uh, but you got to go get it. And, and you just, you just got to be persistent. You're not, and so I never walked away as so I stayed back there for as long as it took. Um, you know, I also when it came to getting gigs, in, in Vermont, it was one thing, but when the band started to expand and we wanted to go into New York and Boston, it was a different story. And this is back in the day when we, we still had cassette tapes. You know, we had our demos on cassette tapes. If you had some money, you had a CD-ROM. Uh, but <laughs> most of the demos were on cassette tapes. Did you burn those yourself? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did, we did, yeah. Or you had to pay somebody to do it. Um, and so just, I remember just standing outside some of these bars in, in Boston and these nightclubs in Boston and waiting. You know, I knew who these people were and there's no internet, so I didn't look somebody up on LinkedIn and go, oh, hey, I want to link into you. I want to play at your, in your bar. It was, you had to figure out who it was and stay there and go day after day or go to these clubs at night and see who was playing and see who was paying them and who was standing there in the back and figure it out and then stand out on the sidewalk and see when they went to work and uh you know just wait for them to walk in and chase after behind them hey here's my tape here's my tape this, our band is awesome we're, we're gonna we're gonna rock it yeah, let's open up for somebody we'll play for free free beer actually and <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they uh but just you had to chase after it and i guess the moral of all that is is just persistence I and mean, you just can't give up you can't did you take anything else away from your educational experience in music <laughs> Well, I mean, the the, uh, the rigor around the music program was was pretty intense, and, and Berkeley was was to me it was easy because I loved it and I love jazz, and um, I love the music. I love being around the energy in Boston, and for me that was amazing. And, and I lived there for a while too, but it, when I went to UVM, uh, it, it I, they didn't have a jazz program, and it was classical. And I had a background in classical, but I did not want to play classical. So it was sitting through all these classes, and it was 20th century theory and composition, which, as much as I hated it, what I realize now was that that was my background in analytics and, and, and computer engineering. It's, um, it was around solving problems and you know analyzing music and, and scores and, and looking at permutations across different instruments and the modulations and the music. And that is, it's just, ones and zeros it's not all that different than computer programming so the structure that that taught as well that sometimes you have to learn things that you don't like and you have to be, you know build a discipline around that that that's i'd say that's probably one of the best things that i took from that what was then your first the first business you started if, um so if you don't count the the bands and you know and, and the promotions uh the first business was an advertising agency doing media buying and planning <clears throat> And so this probably puts us around 1998, 1999. And I had a recording studio. And I was recording bands and playing in a band, so like four or five bands at a time, and just trying to you know, survive and, and make a living. And there was uh, a friend of a friend, I think it is how it went. He owned, they, they, they were partners in a nightclub down in the, in the, in the Waterbury area. And they said, oh, we want to have your band down there. And, you know, it's, it's local and we're going to promote it. It's going to be great. And we played and, and one of the owners came up to me who I didn't really know and said, hey, I got this thing on the side. I do, I do advertising and marketing for sports organizations, mainly ski resorts. And uh, like we should, you know, I'd, I'd love for you to help me. We can, you know, do a jingle and do a TV spot for them and you can get free tickets to ski. I'm like, all right, free stuff, you know, free beer, free ski tickets. I like this theme. Sounds good. And so... Uh, that turned into you know making a jingle and uh, a radio spot and a TV spot and then that person knew somebody at a car dealership who said hey this, this this is really cool this is you know newer music and it's awesome use these guys that turned into that and the guy said uh, hey I think we should bring the studio together that you have and let's take you know my media buying business let's put them together let's create an advertising agency and let's go out and get them and so that was that was the kind of first step into you know, the, the non-music business world, right? 
So you describe that as it just happened to you, but how much of that was you making it happen? Uh, which part? Actually, so you're, you've got a music studio and one day and the next day you have a media buying company. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so he, he had like one client at the time and it was small. And then when I came in and we combined forces, we were able to, to open up different revenue opportunities. And uh, that just, the entrepreneurial spirit, like that sparked is just, it was there. I maybe didn't know it, it wasn't classically trained in it, but it, it just, for me, it was, oh, there's an opportunity there for money, like, we're gonna go after that. So, oh, it, you know, is graphic design, your website, we can do that, you know, we, we couldn't, but we, we did. And, so, and you have to do that sometimes, you just have to go for it. Like, and we had done that before, you know, we'd, we'd say that we would play somewhere and bring a certain number of people there, and we didn't have that number of people to bring to a gig, and you just have to go out and grill a market and recruit. So this, to me, this was no different. We were gonna figure it out, and we were gonna go get it done. And, uh, and we did. I think what really happened in all that was when he said, hey, we should become partners. You know, you brought a bunch of stuff to the business. I've already got this existing base. Let's give it a go. And at the, actually at the time, I was living in Boston. And he was in Connecticut. And, uh, and this is actually crazy. I, I think I know why he asked me. I, I opened up the yellow pages. I, I literally took the yellow pages. I had a Massachusetts copy, Boston. And I had a Connecticut copy, Howard, Hartford County. And I opened up the yellow pages and just... <laughs> And I just started dialing the phone, like the rotary phone, <laughs> and just dialing the phone and dialing the phone and like with a pen and a highlighter and just like, you know, scraping through it like, nope, 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 nope. And then the people that um, would answer the phone, like they go into a nice little bucket in a category and I'd rip those pages out and I'd put it on here and I'm like, we're going to call all those companies. And so it just, you know, I dialed the phone hundreds of times a day. And... Uh, closed a bunch of deals and got a bunch of meetings, but they were all in Connecticut. <laughs> so the, the, the Massachusetts yellow book like went in the garbage and then the Connecticut yellow book came out and I got all these meetings and I went into Connecticut and we closed deals and, you know, four or five customers like in a very, very short period of time, TV commercials, radio jingles, media buying, advertising, you know, strategies and consulting. I think they're just like the energy, you know, like young kids coming in and you know, young people coming in. So yeah, that was how that got started. And then, and then I, you know, left that apartment, rented it to a, a buddy, <laughs> and just, you know, came back to Connecticut and, you know, set up shop in my parents' basement. What year was this about? That's like 98, 97, 98. What was the digital advertising world like? <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, so we did TV and radio spots uh, for a while. Uh, and, and that's actually, it's quite mathematical because there's a you know, cost per point analysis and understanding, you know, who's going to drive by what area when. It was the beginning of analytics for me, and I didn't realize it. And it was old school Excel crunching, right? It's like crunching numbers and building models in Excel and trying to, to, to understand populations based on third-party census data and anticipate whether that was happening or not, and then negotiating cost per point. So I was using my negotiation skills and my mathematical skills, which really from music, to help negotiate, um, you know, th these t these few things, but there was no digital, and the only digital was websites. So everyone had said, "Well, this is a digital brochure." So that, you know what the positive here is: we don't have to pay for printing. So this is good. This is good. We're gonna we're gonna do this. And so we got into the web design business, and we were telling people that you could push people to your website from your TV and radio commercials, and that was like, you know climbing a very steep mountain. So that's what the landscape was like, trying to convince somebody not to do digital marketing, but that in your offline advertising, you should tell people about your website. That's, that's, that's where we were in the evolution. So eventually, you, the company, I don't know if it's the same company or different company, but you morph into selling software. How does that happen? And is that a new organization or do you mold that company into something new? It, uh, from a corporate perspective, it became a new company. Um, the media buying business was kept separate. The digital advertising agency morphed into a new company and the, the, the call it software development side of that, um, stayed in that same company uh, underneath that roof. And what had happened was we got in contact with a benefits planning organization. So these are organizations that go to employers and say, 
uh, you, you have all your employees, you have open enrollment season, and this is how old school this is. We have to put a print brochure together to let everybody know the benefits that are available to them, and they have to rip out the form in the back and fill that out, and then that's how they know that their families are going to be covered by, by the insurance. And um, a, a this is actually this is interesting that you brought this up. It was an Indian India-based company that they had closed, and the India-based company Patney. I don't even know if they're around anymore. Um, who, who employed tens of thousands of developers, hired this benefits agency to go find another company to build a database application tool. And that was my first you know, experience in, in developing an application. I think we built it in MySQL and PHP. And it was just a workflow process of fill out the form, hit next, fill out, put your family in, data validation, and so on and so forth. And uh, But they paid us a bunch of money. And I remember thinking to myself, this is... If they're paying that much money to not print a brochure, there's something there's something going on here. And, and all the data and the storage pond and the analytics that we at that time exported and put into an Excel file and like munged and crunched and did that back and gave it back to them as a service. So all of a sudden, this business for one or two customers became as big, if not bigger, than the digital agency and creative agency that we were running at the time. So that was to me like light bulbs went off. Was that a case where somebody said, can you do this? And you just said, yes, even though... This is correct, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we said, oh, yeah, we could do that. We could build a database, no problem, yeah. So eventually then you got into selling third-party software, right, and servicing it? Yes. So um, looking at what that application was actually attempting to do, it, it, it's really basic. It was just a database, and we were pushing information in, in, into a, a structured database. Um, that, to me, was really a CRM tool. And it was kind of part and parcel to the process that we were going through with our digital customers where we were telling them, you should really push people to a website. And this is like a year or two later, and it's like, you can build this thing called a form, a web form on your website, and people can put their information in there. And when they hit go, it just doesn't have to go to an email. It could actually go into a database and you can print it out. It's amazing. And, and like in a row, or you can like use an Excel file. And so it was, let's not push it into a database. Let's use a traditional CRM tool. And this is before Salesforce was really popular. And CRM was uh, a subdivision of ERP, right? So, it, you know, a, an organization would like go to, I'm trying to think of the names if we still remember, like uh, Microsoft, Great Plains, um, Infor was a, was a big one. Um, you know, Oracle, right, had, had, you know, PeopleSoft and all these other tools. And they were just, you know, the beginnings of these large, like, database enterprise applications. CRM was a practice. H HRM, human, you know, resource management. And CRM, customer relationship management. And SFA, Salesforce automation. These were all, like, little pieces. And Mark Benioff at the time was working at Oracle and saw what they were doing with Siebel, and then he broke off, and he put that in the cloud. I mean, it was a massive, massive moment you know, in, in, in cloud enterprise technology. And we were right at the beginning of that, and they were just getting going. I mean, they had like 150 employees. And uh, found them online, and uh, I think I picked up the phone and called somebody there and just said, we wanna, we wanna, I want to do something with this. And got somebody on the phone, and so they said, yeah, should we have partners? Yeah, here you go. We're going to give you free access to this. And I said, we don't have to build database software anymore. Like, we can just plug it into someone else's technology. So that was kind of the OEM, ISV model that started off, you know, what, what I'm in today. At that point, is the agency still going? Have you transitioned fully? And how do you think about, like, managing your time and resources? Yeah. So in 2006, I bought that partner out took all the digital and then, you know, built it up into what it was. So that, that, that had to happen first. Then I found Salesforce. Then we found Eloqua, which is a marketing automation platform. And I found Eloqua because Salesforce started the app exchange. And there's a guy by the name of Ron Hollison who, uh, you know, now runs global partner for Microsoft and uh, got to know that guy like really early on. It's like, I think I cold called him, right? And just... He's like, yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, these are our partners, and uh, why don't you come out here? And, you know, I explained to them what we wanted to do, and uh, they hooked us up and, and introduced us to Eloqua. Then Eloqua became a partner. So this is when the digital agency was less about creative and web design, and it became more about we're going to put demand generation automation programs in place for you with other technologies. So this is now called systems integrators, right, so an SI. So we became Eloqua's fourth SI, 
um, and we were early on the map with Salesforce. And most of the SIs in the marketing and in, in the space were, were focused on SFA, so deploying Salesforce for sales teams so that they can go in the field and record their data and do opportunity tracking. That was SFA. We said, I think that there's going to be a movement around CRM and marketing specifically. We're going to do integrations between Eloqua and Salesforce only. And uh, that was 80% of their business by the time they, they sold to Oracle for a billion dollars. And uh, we were, you know, we just grew a business on that. So that's the, to that point. So it sounds like things are going really well. And then you decide to build your own software. What's the genesis of that? Uh, Eloqua um, took some funding and some capital. And I backed into the numbers and understood the valuation and just said, you know, wow, we're missing the boat here. Because, you know, I had looked at a couple other companies, you know, to, to acquire who were smaller and they were on EBITDA multiples and uh, it was just, you know, it was a creative business. So we we're trying to figure out how to buy them or merge with them. And then I just started to figure out what they were doing. And I'm like, who was paying eight to 10 times, 12 times revenue, forward revenue? We're missing something here. And it just, what is it that we're missing? It's ACV, uh, annual contract value, recurring revenue, multi-contract, you know, deals. And that was just starting to really happen. So I said, okay, whatever we do, I got to find a developer. I got to find more core developers. You got to find more analysts, like people who can really work with data. And we've got to go build a technology. And whether we're, we're an app on their app exchange or we create our own exchange or our own platform, like we've got to do something. We got a draft behind this. And um, I went out west and they didn't, they, they, they weren't down with the concept, like of, of kind of what we had, what we were thinking about. And it's in, in the west coast is really territorial. It was more territorial than it used to be. And they didn't really, they kind of had their network and they just, they weren't really interested in speaking to us. So they kind of sent me back east. And I had a, a business partner at the time. He was running sales and he ended up becoming a partner. Um, and still, just, you know, to this day, you know, in the business, an awesome guy. Um, and he had the healthcare background. And he said, if we take this concept which is blowing up i mean we were we were growing like you know 70 60 70 percent a year at that time in revenue he's like if we took this concept and we applied those technologies into healthcare he's like i've been at hospitals he's like all they care about is billboards he's like if we can turn them digital we're going to crack this thing wide open and uh that was the beginning of that right so can you can you before we move on for if anybody doesn't know here sort of run them through what a variant looked like at launch and inception and what it looks like today. Yeah, so when Evariant first started, um, so let, let's just take it at that moment in time, like we have this like, you know, pinnacle, like, you know, just, it's just a moment, right, an epiphany, where we just say, wow, this is our moment. We don't have to be a systems integrator, we don't have to take services revenue, we don't have to fight for every dollar and reset every year and fight for contracts. We can build a software business and we can create a recurring revenue stream. At the time, the, the focus was let's get lots of users on the platform. Let's charge them a per user per month, you know, fee. And that was the trend at that at that point. There's a lot. More, there's still some on that, but the world has changed to trans transactional um, value, where it's not about users anymore or enterprise value. But let's just go back in time, and it was all about users. How many users can we get? So we started thinking about the number of hospitals, times the number of people that could use it, and we, we came up with a business model, and you know, we thought we could charge a premium on that versus what the market was able to bear. And what the company looked like at that point was very rudimentary. So we, were, we went to Salesforce and convinced them to let us white label the product, and went to Eloqua and convinced them to let us white label the product. Uh, so this is you know, very bootstrapping-ish. And uh, they, they both said, okay, right? Because they were startup companies. I mean, this is multi-billion dollar companies now. They were startup companies back then. So they were, you know, I was walking into the CEO of, of, of Eloqua, right? And we were, we were chatting and they were, he was, you know, giving us advice. I mean, it was an amazing time, you know, to, to be in, in the cloud business. And the business uh, took off because in healthcare, nobody knew what Salesforce was. Nobody wanted to know what Salesforce was. They just saw our logo on the top, and they said, great software. And nobody knew what Eloqua was, and no one cared what Eloqua was at the time. So they just figured out, whatever, this is great, awesome, great product, guys. And just no one asked, and we didn't tell at the time. And we just we pushed through 
uh, this this space where we're able to resell and white label and put that on our paper. So that's that's like kind of day one into the first year, and it just I mean it took off. I mean this was a gr- this was a group of organizations doing direct mail. Who do we think needs a mammography? Send them a direct mail piece. Tell them where to go. Who do we think might be interested in hip and joint replacement? Send them a direct mail piece. Tell them where to go and what what 800 number to call. That's the level of sophistication that we were dealing with at that time. So cloud was beyond their wildest dreams. At what point do you look to raise outside capital? And uh, what is it that sort of gets you over the hurdle to actually make it happen? Yeah. So let's just say that at that moment where we had that kind of, you know, epiphany around we should get into, into this game and get into cloud software, at least from an OEM perspective. And just for anyone's, uh, anyone's benefit, OEM meaning I take someone else's technology and I embed it into my technology or, and or I white label it, I resell it. Which means that when we went to a customer and we wrote a contract, it was our contract. We held the paper, we held the responsibility, we, had, we held you know, the, the, the liability on that. Um, which there's not a lot of that today. People have moved away from that. But that, that, was, that was our business model. Um, we couldn't run the business solely on those healthcare customers because there wasn't enough of them. So we had American Express and ADP and Hewlett Packard and Juniper Networks. We were doing eloquent implementations for them and managed services contracts for them. We were standing up their technology. We were running marketing programs for them. We were designing emails and landing pages and building flows and personas and, pay, and, and uh, consumer journeys, if you will. Um, you know, delivering PowerPoint as a service, right? I mean, we were doing reporting as a service, doing Google Analytics as a service, you know, doing their ad placement. And Google Analytics has, had turned, you know, um, you know uh, quite significant at that time. And Amateur Adobe, we were a partner of them so before Adobe bought them. So we were doing analytics as a service for Amateur. Um, i trying to think. It, it was a number of technologies that we were offering as a managed service, right? Because th- these people didn't have the technology or the skills. They didn't have the capacity or the budget. They hadn't convinced their business that these people are people you should hire. So um, we were getting paid out of a marketing budget if we were bootstrapping the business, um, non-recurring revenue contracts. Let's say that's 2008 um, to 2010, 2011. And then the, the base of customers for health systems it wasn't massive, but what they were paying was big and it was recurring. And we were able to put the contracts in a recurring value. And I think we actually met someone in Connecticut. I think it was a Connecticut Innovations. They came to us and uh, said, we, we'd love to fund this. And we, we did some pitches with them. But somewhere along the way, uh, someone found out in New York and uh, through a health system. A health system, I think, came to us and said, we want to invest in your, we think we should invest in one of our partners. And uh, we met Health Enterprise Partners out of Manhattan. And they were a portfolio. Their LPs are all health systems, pharma, life science, payers. And uh, they, you know, spent a lot of time doing diligence on the company. And where out west, they weren't interested in verticals. They're like, eh. Horizontal technology platform, analytics platform, CRM, marketing automation, ad tech was hot. And they're like, mm, verticals, not interested. Uh, and so we said, okay, we're back out, out east. And they said, verticals, we love. Tech provider, love it. Yes, l- tell me about it. Okay, we see it, we get the vision, we see the market opportunity. Uh, we're going to invest. So th- we took a, in November of 2011, we took, I think, like a three, three and a half million dollar Series A investment on the company. But it was great because it, it wasn't um, an idea that didn't have revenue behind it. We had a couple million in revenue. So I think we got discounted on some of the non healthcare customers and we took a premium on the SaaS revenue and we figured it out and we worked it out and boom, you know, we got funded. How does that fundraising change the business? Are you still white labeling at that point? Yes. Yeah. So we were white labeling, but we knew that we had to have our own um, uh, analytics infrastructure. So we took that money and we, uh, we hired more database folks. Uh, so we, we set up some data centers. Uh, we started uh, um, investing in integration tools so that uh, the data wasn't in Salesforce anymore. Cause, and, and to be candid, Salesforce couldn't handle the data. It, it, it was, number one, it's expensive. It's not the kind of data, it's not transactionally focused in that sense in terms of volumes of data. Um, or at least it wasn't at the time. And we were starting to collect customers' healthcare information. So that was, you know, and this is before massive cybersecurity breaches. So 
we were signing contracts and people weren't asking us for, you know, all the compliance certificates that they do now, which are very expensive. And uh, so we knew we had to create a database infrastructure and we started getting into Hadoop um, and big data technology. And a lot of money started getting sucked into that because it was early on and there weren't a lot of frameworks for it. And it, it was you couldn't go to Amazon and, and, and you know, spawn up a, a, you know, open up like a, you know, a a Hadoop node. It just didn't exist. So you had to buy bare metal and buy servers and then go drill them like into a data center, you know, and connect them and pay somebody to watch the servers for you. So that's where the money started to go. Um, so it sounds like you skipped what would typically be a seed round because you were funding yeah, no yourself. Seed. We, we, we bootstrapped it. Um, do you have, so I imagine there's at least a couple of people in this room that have an idea that probably needs some funding. Is there general advice you give to people on the right way to approach that? Do you suggest that people try to bootstrap if at all possible? Um, and you know, what do you think people kind of need to walk in yeah. the door with? So let, let, let's do, do you need to get a seed fund? I, I, I mean, as transparent as I can be about this, it, it all depends on how much you know about what you really want to do. And if you've thought this thing to the ground, and, and I'm, what I mean by thinking it to the ground is, you know, what's your level of expertise in like actually analyzing a true business opportunity? So I meet with a lot of people who say, oh, I hear what you've done. That's so awesome. I have this awesome idea. And then they start talking about a, a, a mobile app or a SaaS product or something like that. And, and nowadays, immediately, the first thing is like, I'm like, well, Google's already has a framework for that. I mean, what's your, what's your competitive mode? Like, what's your, what's your defensibility on that product? And that's, oh, uh, that's good. Thank you. That's, that's good. And, or, you know, I'm going to build another app. Like, how are you going to monetize that? You know, like, well, how big is your TAM? How big is your, your, your addressable market? What's the bottoms up? What's the tops down? I mean, these are frameworks that you have to really, really, really think through. And, and the, the, the chasm of death for startups is just, it's sad. Right. And there's especially in Connecticut, there's not enough resources and capital and people to get behind it. And you need the development resources. And, you know, just to know what's going to succeed and not succeed is a difficult thing. So if you can, my recommendation to you is like if you if you have the time to talk to every single person that you can possibly imagine, that's users, investors, entrepreneurs, um, other companies, other investment companies, like take as much time as you can. I don't care if it takes a year. Think that thing to the ground. And the minute you can get to the point where enough people have told you it's a bad idea, you should probably listen to them. You know, and, and, I'm, and if you're asking the right people, I don't mean asking your friends and family, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean, like, are you talking to tech entrepreneurs and, and people who've done this before? And are you talking to investors? Because investors are, you know, they're tough to deal with, but like they see so many companies every single day and they, they see the graveyard. So unless you have some kind of amazing vision and you've already done research that they are unable to do, chances are they've already thought through this. So really, really pressure test this and ask them and, and you'll get your answer. Fail fast, like fail as fast as you possibly can and don't hang on to something that just is emotional. Like get to the answer and figure out, make sure it's a big enough addressable market. You can defend it, that your economic moat is like, is very defensible, it's wide and deep and ask everybody you possibly can who's a true end user of the product, who's a buyer of the product, and think about all the companies that could potentially step into the space and develop it, because they'll just squash you. If you come up with a good idea, they'll squash you. I watched Salesforce do it time and time again. So we entered in a, in a place where nobody was OEMing. So we walked into a market that there was no cloud, we walked into a market where Salesforce didn't even think about, and we just took it by storm. That doesn't happen anymore. Not not on someone else's product. They're already these companies are coming in thinking about verticals and horizontals and mergers and acquisitions. It's just it's a fast moving market. So to have an opportunity that lasts a year or two without anybody paying attention to you, I mean that that doesn't exist anymore. So take the time to think through it. And if you ask enough people, you'll get the answer that someone's thinking about it. And will you be able to raise enough capital and have something that's defensible? So <clears throat> That's my first point. Second point is, if you can come up with an idea that you think is that good, 
and you want to pressure test it, pressure test it with consulting services. Make some money while, while you're building your idea. Uh, you know, get some people to pay you for it. Right? I mean, let, let's say you want to build a, a set of technology that analyzes a certain set of data and kicks out some analytics and predictive models and connects to a bunch of other apps in an ecosystem. Like, okay, cool. Figure out all those things and then go out there and build it the way that you don't have to build it from scratch. Because if you can do that, then the first question you should ask yourself is, well, why would you go build it from scratch? The second question you should ask yourself is, if I can do it this quick, well, then how many other people can do it? If you do get to a place where you've actually figured out how to build this and how to make money, then you have to ask yourself, what's the actual total addressable market? What's the TAM? How big is this? Like, can I repeat this process over and over and over and over and over again and grow it significantly year over year to a point where someone's just going to get nervous about it and take me out? Or you, you, you've, you've found an untapped category. And if you found an untapped category, you got to run and go. And then you need to be prepared to raise some serious capital. So uh, that's my advice. A couple more questions yeah. before we open up to Q&A. Uh, this one, I'm going to ask like four questions at okay. the same time to okay. try to squeeze them all in. You gotcha. uh, so at some point, you open up an office in Austin. Yeah. Uh, what was the driver of that? What differences do you see? And what can Connecticut do to become more competitive over time? I'll, match, I'll check back with you make sure I've covered all these. But So we opened up an office in Austin. We raised a Series B. It's about $20 million. We, we went back out west and said, I told you. I told you verticals were it. it, it come on. And they said, yeah, absolutely. And we raised a bunch of money. And uh, the minute we raised the money out west, they said, so you do know that you're not going to be able to do this out east. Um, you're definitely not going to do it in Connecticut. And uh, you know, of course, we didn't believe that. But the, the, the reality was true. Um, the engineering talent required to build a major technology stack at scale is not here right now, not yet. And I care enough about it that I'm on the tech council and, and have met with the governor and met with the commissioner and, and have, have voiced my opinions on all this. And they, they put me on a board to do something about it. And so I spend a lot of time meeting with venture capital firms and banks and, you know, entrepreneurs and in the ecosystem. But that was the reality. And, and it was it wasn't like let's have a nice you know soft conversation about this. It was like no, you're gonna you're gonna pick these three places and you're gonna do it. You're gonna go to San Francisco. You're gonna go to New York. You can maybe go to Boston or you can go to Austin, Texas. Somewhere along that lines, right? And that's how the conversation went. Um, you know, I, to make this happen here, you all have to continue to, to to be involved in this kind of stuff. You have to continue to come up with ideas. And you have to be passionate about it, but you have to think through them, right? I mean, we can't, you've, you've got to really, really think about what the, what the potential opportunities are and what's the, what's the possibility for success. And, and then there have to be more funding opportunities here. I mean, there can't be, you know, four or five, you know, venture capital firms. I mean, out west, I mean, you go to Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park, I mean, you, you can literally walk up and down for, for days, you know, like what do they say? Like in the Louvre, like if you spent was like 30 seconds at every painting, you'd be there for however many years, like that's Silicon Valley, like on Sand Hill road. Like if you've spent a couple hours at every one of these VC firms and, and private equity firms, you'd be there for years. And so there's, there's a massive opportunity for money, but think about that. Where's that here? We need that here. We really do. And that means that you guys have to have ideas. And if you get them, try so hard to keep them here, you know, and push to keep that money here, you know, and push the, the banking community and the investment community to keep it here. So it's possible. There's, I mean, I go to, I go to Yale. I, I go to UConn. There's smart people here. I, I see all these. There's smart people in these companies. But how do you compete with that when your top students are just going to get poked you know, by Facebook and, 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 and Google? And they're going to get poached. And what are they going to do? Turn it down? You get flown out there and you go take a look at that opportunity and, and what it's like to work out there. Why, I, I, don't bl I wouldn't blame anybody. Why would you turn that opportunity down? So we have to create an ecosystem that you know, supports entrepreneurs but supports the lifestyle and the ecosystem of what a business is run like in this stage to compete with that. You, know, you don't have to you know, have you know, daycare you know, and, and, and do everyone's laundry, although that's what is what they do. But, but you, you, you have to have a, an, an environment that promotes learning and that's going to promote training because all, all most people want is an opportunity to learn more, but you have to give it to them. How actively did you sort of think about and manage your culture with that in mind? Well, we had the luxury of the capital. Um, 
I mean, the question could start and stop right there. It, it, it's about money. And we had the runway and the money to, to do these kind of things, you know, to, you know, open up those facilities and, 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 and build them nice internally and feed people every day and, and, and do those kind of things. You know, and, but I'll tell you, I'll be, I'll be completely honest, like as you grow and, and as, you know, your investors like push you more towards, you know, cash flow break even and, and profitability, you know, these are the things that are going to be like, okay, everyone had a good time. What's, we're, we're gonna, we can pull back on some of these things and, you know, or we have to, you have to watch, you know, the way that we're handling some of these external events. I mean, just, it's just a reality, you know, and you, you transition from a, in a growth stage, like a startup to, you know, a growth company you know, pretty quick. And those are two different things. And that's a, it's a good place to be when you get there, but there's, there's other difficult conversations that potentially can happen as you start to transition that culture style. Any questions? Questions. Yes. Yeah, it's a ch unfortunately it's a chicken and an egg. So uh, I believe it's a easily a ten year problem or, or ten year trajectory to solve here. Um, I think that whether we like it or not, it starts in the school systems and it starts in the STEM programs. Uh, you know, I, let's let, let give you an example. So our Series B investor invested in Snap. Um, you know, and that's, you know, we all know that the IPO on the, on the outset went, went well, you know, where they're going right now is, you know, it's not maybe what they expected, but it's still an amazing outcome. There's a public school system in San Francisco who invested in that company. I mean, just, just, just think about that for a second. Like the, a public, I think it was a middle school, right? I, invested money in Snapchat. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I mean, so just you, when you when you compare and, and you think about the the mindset that's required, you know, and, and you go out west, for example, even in Boston, I mean, it just in, in other areas, there's people thinking about in high school and even in other grades, like build a, an app or build something and then and, and get funding and, and, and there's just programs and incubators. So look, I think we have to have a STEM focus, right? First of all. Um, I think that in the business ecosystem, and I've talked to some folks here tonight, an understanding of what data science really means and, and the importance of it and the value at the management level and at the executive level as how important this is because you're going you're gonna to get your lunch wiped out from you if you don't figure out how to do this. So it, it, if, if you look at the education system as a much, much longer term problem, um, I think then step up and then get to the colleges. And so I know Yale has just released a, a, a true data science program, I think the second or third in, in the country, which is awesome. There's a, there's a, there's a full-blown curriculum around this. Uh, I, you know, I, I went and, and saw the presentation. I met with you know, the, the, the folks who had that up. I mean, they've got the right idea there. They're going to produce great talent. The talent's maybe not going to stay in the state of Connecticut, but, but that's okay. That's a good start. <laughs> so let's just say that, that that's a longer-term plan. If you want your short-term solution, in my opinion, you've got to do education with the businesses in Connecticut about the importance of machine learning. I hate the word AI. Like, I hate the term AI. But it's like machine learning and data engineering and big data because it's you've got to figure out how you're going to apply those things to transform your business and they have to take it seriously and it's not just at the larger companies like the insurance companies you know in the aerospace i mean it, it's got to be at the manufacturing companies and it's got to be at like at, at the mid-sized companies they have to figure it out and when they do that there'll be a pressure for them to hire those jobs more people will have opportunity to keep those jobs in state and then we can start the trend in the right direction it's a good question thank you yes Yeah. Ultimately, if you, if you have the capital availability here, companies will expect out of Silicon Valley and come here. You know, there's so many that don't get funded. There's so many great ideas, but we always can move them here. We can be mm -hmm. closer, not the one we closed. 
Yeah. I think that's not that difficult. You know, I think the fundamental problem is that we are setting up organizations to do uh, like CPC, great people, but none of them have actually done the stuff uh, on the team. For instance, uh, CII, great organization. You know, there's 120 million dollars spent, but as of last year, from what I understand, it only deployed 40. Correct. And only into a few small entities, and that's it. In late stage, you take all the heads of their bets. So there's nobody here providing true seed capital. Correct. I have some good news for you. Uh, the good news is that um, the state, the state treasurer, uh, has deployed about 150 plus million dollars of capital for exactly what you're talking about, and it was deployed. It was decided upon around 2015, and it's uh, it's gone into its execution phase uh, this year. Um, it's broken into three separate components. Uh, there's a debt component. Um, there's a private equity buyout component, and there is a venture capital component. There is a, a venture capital firm um, whom I know well. Uh, we, th they've done we've done business with them at Evariant, uh, Fairview Capital, and it's an amazing group of people. Um, just uh, highly focused. Uh, they are uh, they have backgrounds in um, in business and tech out west. Uh, their fund is a fund of funds, so they they're invested in. Lightspeed and, and other major uh, investment firms uh, out in Silicon Valley, but they reside here in West Hartford, Connecticut, um, and uh, they have capital and they, they, they are looking to do seed funding. So that's, uh, you figure about $150 million that they have about three years to deploy. So that's there. Does the state need to start thinking about doing a, 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 a better job about talking about it? And they are. So I'm on the tech council. Um, so I, I, I felt like you felt. And I complained about it and but I was given an opportunity to do something about it and uh, that's why I say on the 10-year thing I'm talking more about a fundamental fundamental cultural shift in, in, in particular in stem and then the next phase of that is, is business administration but but around stem in particular because I mean it's just it's the obvious right I mean you're you're highly unlikely that you're going to have a business that doesn't have some kind of major focus on, you know, physics, mathematics, engineering, chemical engineering, and so on and so forth. So, um, and then a second point that you made, I, I too, for many years, I have lived on a plane, you know, four or five days a week, a tremendous strain on, on your life uh, from an entrepreneur perspective. Like it's, you want it and then you do it and you're like, I'm on a plane again. And you start to see the same people in all these airports, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, but that is not sustainable and that is not good for the culture. Like you can't have people going back and forth between between uh, offices like this in a startup phase. You need people centralized together, working together, having town halls and company meetings. I I've lived through it. Like in the difference in the, the disparateness between, you know, the, an engineering organization in Austin and, and our and our our main headquarters up here in Farmington, you know, had its cultural issues. And if you cannot have to do that, then then why? So I, I totally agree that you can do that, and entrepreneurs can find the opportunity to go get that capital and bring it back here and deploy it. But but we're a small few, and and the majority who do get it will 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 go if they're in an early stage because they're incentivized to do it. So um, I think I think good news, all good news all around. But it's just we have to we have to kind of settle in for the long haul and put pressure on people to uh, you know to stay here and to deploy capital here. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, what was my biggest mistake along the way? I mean, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I'll, maybe I can just summarize them. I won't take too long. <laughs> uh, fail. Uh, sometimes not failing fast enough. You know, I am. I, I believe I'm a passionate and energetic person, and with that came an, an amount of energy that allowed me to just persevere. The negative piece of that is that sometimes I just wouldn't let go of the truth. This is not working. Don't do it. You know, like, just stop it. You know, just like, just listen. Listen to people. No, 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 we're going to do it. 
We drive through it. We walk through the walls. Everyone's going to do it. You know, get everyone expired. Almost over-inspired. And over-inspiration can lead to major, you know, deflation. <laughs> right? And just you have, to, you have to think about that in a startup culture where, I mean, you can only get everybody so pumped up all the time. <laughs> Until it's like, all right, I got to go back out there and I got everybody pumped about this one again. This, this, is, this is, you know, we're not batting strong here. And so you, you just fail fast and admit. That's, that's one, in no particular order. Uh, the second thing is, is management decisions. I, I'll, I'll give you that as my biggest mistake of all time. Management decisions in a startup business, it's like, uh, I would refer to it as dog years, okay? Where, you know, it's like a one to seven ratio, perhaps, something like that. And if, let's say... I'll just use an example, and not not to to my business, but I'll just use an example, right? To you know, to keep it, uh, you know, up here. Let's say that y- your business is getting going and it's really pumping, okay? And you have found a category that's going to work, and your idea is it's live. Like you were right. It's like yes, right? So this is where you're like, I told you, you get to, get, I told you, and everyone's like, I told you so, and then everyone goes, oh, we already, we believed in you, we believed in you, and then you got this momentum, this wind in your sails, and you can go raise capital, you can do all these things, and then you have this moment, and these moments don't happen all the time, and there are moments when everything is working, <laughs> and they're rare, and when everything is clicking, and everything is working, and everyone believes in you, and everyone wants to give you money, and everyone just wants to run through walls, and then you go and hire the wrong person. Okay? And just think about the momentum that you had and that you lost. And I'll give you an example. Let's just use sales as the example. An executive, and even a startup, right, is going to take six months on average to understand your business, okay, and get to know the customers and get to know the people. And if you're an entrepreneur, like many of you probably in here are, and you've won the minds and spirit of all your employees, and they believe in you, and then you bring a person in, and they believe in that person because they believe in you, it's your reputation. It's no different than anything else in life. You introduce a friend to a friend. If that goes well, that's good. If that goes bad, that's on you. Same thing. People, I mean, we spend more time at work than anywhere else, right? So your reputation, your, your brand is at stake. You're excited. You're not thinking. You look at some information on paper. That resume looks good. Well, people are selling themselves. And when they sell themselves really well, it, it could go bad. And if somebody comes in and they are a, just culturally toxic, you lost six months getting that person in. Okay, You're going to spend an equal amount of time possibly getting them out and fixing the problem. Then you have to go and recruit. That's another three to six months. Then you've got to give them six months in. Just do the math, right? That's ugly. That's 18 months, okay? On average, that is the worst mistake of all. Make that mistake multiple times in a row. Oh, you know? It, it just, it, you don't have that kind of, um, of runway in business nowadays. You cannot fail. Like, you, you cannot fail like that over and over again. And, and, and I just, I didn't, um, I don't even want to say listen to my gut. I just, I didn't do the right amount of research. I've got a friend in New York, he's an engineer, and we used to be in business together, and we would bash heads on this stuff all the time. I was like, you got to move quicker. Stop thinking about everything. Engineer, come on. And he was just like, all right, no, 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 no. I've got to do no process on that. I'm going to create a matrix, and we're, we're going to build a weighted model on that. I'm like, come on. We're missing precious time with deals. Well, he's right because he's running a publicly traded company today. And uh, he's kicking ass. And it, it, he did it the long, slow way. But he, he picked a category winner. He got in early. He focused. But like his methodology for human resources and hiring, especially executives, I mean, he would say it's all equal. One toxic you know, individual in a company, it, it, just, it just spreads. And so his methodology on all this is just, it's just an absolute just grind to get to the right person and they have to meet everybody. Like I'd say, oh, you know, you guys meet this person. They're like, oh, you like him, Bill? Oh, yeah, I like him. Okay, cool. We're good. We believe in you. That's wrong. That was like a big mistake. Like everyone's got to meet this person. Everyone has to have the ability and transparency to feel like they can open up and weigh in because I'm telling you, 18 months is not what you need in a startup culture because 18 months is cash, right? That's cash. And if you raise money, 
You know, and that's why VCs are like, what's your management team? Who's your management team? That's why they ask. They care, but it's like they want to know that you're going to succeed, but they won't, they won't really want to know that no one's going to jet and no one's going to mess up the culture and then have to be rehired. That's serious, serious capital. So that's my biggest mistake, like not taking the right amount of time to think about a management team and even the hires below them. I'd say one more point, because I'm so passionate about this one. In a startup culture, I'd say even up to, up to 200 employees, the CEO and all the people on the management team should meet every single person that you hire in that company. Absolutely, every single person. And if someone doesn't believe in it, they shouldn't be in your company. Because that means they're gonna skip something that's important. Yes. So how do you identify a good candidate now after all those uh, that's, that's also a good question. Um, there are a lot of methodologies out there uh, to, to go by. There is, um, uh, there's a great book. Uh, it's called Looks Good on Paper. Read it. Uh, it's a really, really good book. Um, there is uh, a number of methodologies. Uh, there's psychological profile testing uh, that you can have people take. You know, I, I think, you know, some of the biggest things are uh, your priority matrices and building these priority matrices and just forcing people through them and stack ranking them. And uh, there are a number of like Aon, Hewitt and, you know, these HR companies, you know, produce a lot of these things and a lot of them are free. Um, there's consulting firms who do it. Hiring a really, really, really good um, firm, right, an HR firm, a, a, a recruitment firm is is critical right and uh they can they can be your best partner right and and, and a solid human re in a startup company it's tough to hire like a chief people officer you know um but just just get a, get a good partner and and press them on their framework because if they're coin driven they're gonna they're gonna push people through the pipeline quick because they want their commission if you go on a success retainer you know and you build provisions in the Excuse me, to get money back, they'll spend a little bit more time. So think about your contracts with your human resources and in your uh, your staffing firms. Yes. Correct. Oh, well, there was beating of heads. For me to redo it right now, it's right from the start. I mean, it really, really is. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mess around. You're going to pay for it. Like, you're going to pay for it at some point in time. You know, I, I, I met with a company um, a couple weeks ago. Somebody, a, a friend had asked me, you know, in the investment community, can, can you go meet with these guys? Really cool company. Like, an awesome opportunity. Like, you know, just get in a room with them. I got in a room with these guys. There's three or four of them. And it's immediately for me, just like, that's there's just, there's dissonance um, in here. There's, they're, they're, they're in front of someone that they don't even know that a respected person in their network has invited them in and this is how they're behaving. And I don't mean like, you know, they're swearing at each other and throwing, you know, you know beer bottles at each other. I, I mean, just, yeah, there's openly disagreeing in, in a non-constructive way, in a disrespectful way, like, oh, you know, the rolling of the eyes, uh, you know, just like things like this. I mean, th these are just immediate, immediate disrespect. What's, how can you grow a management? That means that that person does that. And the people that work for them roll their eyes at the people that work for them. And, and it's, a taught, it's, it's, it's a taught behavior. And, and uh, you know, to think, for myself to think about doing it again, you know, it's just, I, I, you have to raise your, your standard to like the highest you possibly can. Like how do I want to be treated? And that's how I want everyone else to treat other people. It makes so, like a, a part of that mistake was that we would, Look past certain behaviors. I mean, that, that weren't something that would be t like a typical you're fired for. You know, like, oh, well, I mean, it's, you know, just, they, they, they shouldn't talk to each other like that. You know? It wasn't like, you know, some kind of discrimination or something, which is immediate, like, that's a no-go. Like, you're out of here. 
or just acting, you know, a lewd behavior somewhere out, out, out at the office. And we're just talking about uh, just a little bit of little common little comments under your, your your under your breath. Like those things are unacceptable. Like you can never build a culture like that. It's taught and it's passed down. And if you let it happen, because well, you know what, that guy's a killer sales guy, killer. I mean, we got to put up with that. You know, that's what those sales guys are like. And there's ego, and they just want to crush it, and you know, just making their commission. So you know, just, just, just we just got to tell everybody that that's okay. No, that's not okay. Like, and 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 I know that you think that you have to get there, but I've seen even at some of the bigger companies, they they, they don't mess around like that. They just they get rid of it. A good leader does not put up with that. And so, and it's a tough discipline because what are you going to do? Imagine that you're starting up a company and there's three or four of you and somebody comes in and they're like just a whale crusher. Like there's like, I go in and I close enterprise deals and I've got a, I've got a roll deck that'll choke a rhinoceros, right? You guys, you guys watch Boiler Room? So, <laughs> I love those sales movies. You know, that is a tough proposition to turn down. It's like, I have wanted to get into XYZ. You know the, the head of like, purchasing there you know the chief marketing officer there all right cool this guy's awesome he's got but you'll pay for it eventually like what do you want at the end of the day do you want to grow a great company or do you you know or do you want to like you're gonna you're gonna face the pipe you're gonna pay the piper at some point it's tough to say you know i'd love i, I want to believe that like i even when faced with that rolodex you know or the the linkedin profile whatever it is nowadays right it would even when faced with that i will have the you know, the ethics, like to say, no, I, I learned the hard way. I'm not going to make that mistake again. But it, it's, it's at day one for me. It's at day one. It's who you surround, it's your company that you surround yourself with is equal to your success. Last question. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm passionate about this one too. And, and I think I'd like to believe also well-versed in it. Um, it depends on what you're selling. Are you selling a service? Are you selling software? Are you selling enterprise software? Are you selling transactional software? So uh, just from a SaaS perspective, you know, the, the market breaks itself into three categories. Um, you know, like transactional meaning like you can buy whatever you want to buy online. Uh, you know, kind of like a mid-market play where there's a bit of a sales process involved. And then enterprise software, which is very solution selling driven. Um, you have to map your waterfall and your demand waterfall I into those particular products. Um, Account-based marketing, I believe, is a uh, really, really killer strategy nowadays. Account-based marketing meaning, like, I, I don't just look at, you know, a deal. I look at the account and I look at all the influencers in that account. And I work my sales team is focused, like I give them five or 10 deals and you go get them, right? And that means get to know everybody around the influencer, including the buyer and the influencer and the purchaser and the users. Like you market to those account people, you sales call them, you meet them, you, you do everything you can to influence the account because the overarching principle is that social selling is the true selling nowadays, right? It's, w w the facts are that, it was 80 plus percent of the people have already made the buying decision before they've gone into the actual purchasing process. And where does that influence come from? It comes from people that they know. So they pick up the phone and they call. Hey, you know, it's my buddy works over at such and such company and I know that he used you guys and so I figured I'd give you a call. Now it's on you. Now you better have a good sales process to ask the right questions, do the right discovery, you know, do the proper due diligence. So it's, it's social selling in the inbound, right, to kind of touch that. Account-based marketing and then a really, really good sales demand process, like to get to close, you know, or because it's so competitive now, and at, you know, deals can slip at any stage. So uh, there's a company called Serious Decisions. I believe that they're actually in Stanford area, um, maybe Wilton, and they have a fantastic methodology on uh, demand-based uh, marketing, account-based marketing, sales funnel strategies, uh, metrics and reporting. Highly recommend them. Uh, it, it, their subscription is is uh, is pay, much like a gardener or a forester. But there's a lot of free resources online and free webinars and, and downloads that you can get. Highly recommend them if you're not already familiar. Yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's 
Um, just, I, I just don't stop reading. I just read all the time. Uh, read. I mean, I today I, I think I probably read three or four research briefs, you know, from Forrester, and I read one or two from Serious Decisions. Uh, I, you know, I write constantly, like write, just type, write, type, 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 type. Everything I think about, I type, and I put it into a framework. Because I I if you don't type it out, I I the first time you go say it, you're gonna be it. It's gonna mess up, right? So type it, think it, read it, read it, type it, think it, read it, and then speak it. You know, over and over and over again. You know, so I, I like, I will. I, I had a. Um, uh, a new topic that I was going to be speaking about. I'm, I'm, I'm getting prepared to do some blogs and things on data science and, and whatnot. And so I've been going and meeting with people like one-on-one. -on -one. Like today, I did two of them today. I just met with people here today and I, and I pitched people like on this idea and, and just, you know, some of these thoughts that I had because I knew it was going to be awful. <laughs> but, but, or maybe not awful, but I, I knew I was going to mess up and it wasn't going to be smooth. And so I just did it and did it. And then, you know, when I came here and I got into the room in here, I typed out everything that I thought that I'd said and where I made the mistakes. And I just wrote it all down and I, I, I put it in Google Docs and just then I'd check it off and I just keep going and going and going. It's just, it's just to me, we're, we're not all that different than a slow speed machine learning algorithm. <laughs> You know, or just you have to keep repeating the same process over and over and over again, and then it becomes muscle memory. You, 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 you know, wires that fire together, wire together, and that's I, I, I believe that, and that's what that's what I learned that in, in music school. How, how if you if you want to play, if you were memorizing a jazz solo, or you're memorizing you know, a, a piece of music, the the it's repetition which becomes muscle memory, which becomes you know, and, and how many times you do it over and over again, and pay attention to the mistakes and the hard parts. It's just muscle memory. So that's the same thing with speaking and, and I believe um, learning. So, yeah, thank you. I'm going to steal the real last one. Yeah, yeah, do it. Uh, what's next for you? Where do you think you're going to be in three, five years? 35 years? Three, four, oh, three or five. Three or five. <laughs> um, so I, I'm an early stage guy. I, I, I found my own personal struggles and professional struggles uh, at, a, at, a, at a company of scale, like at that 150, 200 mark. Um, mainly because I just love innovation. Like I love reading, I love writing, I love speaking, I love going to the next thing. And when, when you build a company, and, and I, I'm lucky enough, I really, I, I feel a lot of it's luck to have gotten to the stage that I've gotten. I mean, it's not, I don't, it's not without hard work, but even with hard work, there's, there's a lot of failure and, and a lot of, you know, resets. And so to have gotten here, um, you know, I feel very grateful, but you know, it, the, the management and the day-to-day -day consistency required. So we have a new CEO at our company and just, I watch the guy and, and I just say, wow, he's awesome. You know, and, and he and I are completely different people, but just his, he walks in every day and he says the same things and he does the same stuff and he just, he follows it like, you know, just like, like clockwork and around that com conversation around HR, like he, he will not falter on the way he feels about HR. And, and that's a discipline and ethics that I, that I really respect. Um, I have those things, but that's not what I wake up thinking about. Like I'm going to go in and we're going to run operations today. We're, we're going to knock it out of the park and we're going to get like faster, better. I, I just don't think about that. I think about what's the next coolest technology and where are we all going and what do we want to do and, and how are we going to use that? And, and what's the coolest, next coolest thing that we can offer people? And depending on the company, at a certain scale, sometimes people are like, okay, you, you, that's, we're just trying to catch up from last week, Bill. You know? <laughs> and so I, I am, I, I will go into something innovative again. I am passionate about data science. I, I, I think it's, it's everything, right? And whether that's machine learning or deep learning, it's, it's, it's the, the, the concepts of data science in a business that are as commonplace as HR and marketing. That's it. Like that, the faster that happens, the better off we're all going to be. And, and, and I believe, you know, wholeheartedly in that. And what comes along with that is big data, event stream processing, you know, Spark, all, all that, right? So that, that's, I'm very, very passionate about that. And whether it's evangelizing it or working with companies or, or building something. So I have my eyes open, um, you know, technology moves so fast, right? So you, you, by the time you finish thinking through an idea, somebody could have already done it or a bigger company could have ex exploited it. So, uh. It's taking time to think through things and enjoying, you know, what the company has done and, and trying to give back, you know, reaching out to folks like you. And I mean, I, I, I was telling Nick, I just, I've been in New Haven more in the past couple months than I have in, you know, the past five or seven years. 
and uh, it's been so eye-opening for me. And there's this great entrepreneurship down here. There's great companies. I, I completely forgot about you know the wealth of you know you know brain power down here and, and and thoughts. So it's been great to get down and reach out and stay in Connecticut. And uh, so I'm going to focus on Connecticut and focus on the things I'm passionate about in technology. And uh, I, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much for joining yeah. us today. Absolutely.